نشهد أن لا إله إلا الله Islam in Focus is brought to you by Gala Travels. For all your travel needs, call Gala Travels at 416-491-5314 or visit galatravels.com. Islam in Focus is brought to you by PortServe International Limited, providing cargo handling services internationally. Please visit portserve.com. Islam in Focus is brought to you by Five Ways Financial. Free consultation at no obligation. Visit fiveways.com. Uh, we're going to continue to uh, discuss the life of Imam Hussein alayhi salam. Last time uh, we discussed his um, life uh, early on in his childhood and his uh, relationship uh, with the Prophet and um, his family. Uh, today we'll focus more on uh, his um, life um, towards the end and uh, Ashura and so what led to, to the event of Karbala and how after 61 years, um, when the Prophet uh, passed away, how the Muslims uh, ended up uh, killing the grandson of uh, the Prophet. Uh, we're joined again by Hajj um, al-Islam, Mawana Rizvi. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Waalaikumsalam. Um, what was the strategy the Imam used and uh, what can we learn from that to deal with oppression in our time? Well, when we... Uh, look at the strategy used by Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Uh, it actually shows us the, on one hand, the continuity of the purpose of all of our Imams, Imam Hussain, Imam, Imam Ali, Imam Hassan, and Imam Hussain. But it also uh, gives us this lesson that every situation is unique, every problem is unique, and you have to use different methods to deal with it. And this is where we see that, you know, the, the glory of uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam is not his personal glory only. It is uh, multiplied because of, uh, you know, he takes his, his, his family with him. And it's interesting, if you, if you see the purpose, Imam Hussain alayhi salam, uh, when he was first confronted by the governor of Yazid, uh, that we have this message from Yazid that either you pledge allegiance, do bay'at, or we have to kill you and send your head to him. And, and this, is, this is where I come to realize that uh, when Imam went to see uh, Walid, the governor, initially Imam tried to defuse the issue by saying that I am not someone who would pledge allegiance uh, or respond to demand in secrecy. Tomorrow morning, you come to the mosque and publicly ask about it, and then you'll get my response. But when he was threatened there, that, well, you know, either you give the answer or we kill you, that is where he declared uh, very clearly by saying that, you know, Yazid is a person who is a drunkard, a sinner, killer of innocent lives, uh, whereas I am a person who come from the family of the Prophet, where revelation descended, uh, Almighty God showered the mercy of the universe through us. And so a person like me would never give in to a person like Yazid. I think the words he chose are very important, where he says, a person like me, he doesn't just say me, no, anyone in my place and who believes in my values would not accept anyone like Yazid or whoever takes the place of Yazid. So a perpetual message. Uh, that you know, you should not give uh, in to a person like Yazid uh, and his uh, character. Uh, well, in other words, we know that uh, Imam Hussein, before leaving Medina, he wrote a will uh, to explain why um, he is uh, going towards Karbala, what his intention is. Um, can you explain about that will, please? The, the will that Imam Hussain alayhi salam wrote before leaving Medina is very significant because as soon as he realized that his life was in danger in Medina uh, because he had uh, expressed his opposition to Yazid, uh, he decided to leave Medina and go to Mecca, which is a sanctuary for Muslims. But before leaving, he wrote a will and he gave it to his brother Muhammad Hanafiya. 
And this is will, uh, this will is not like the normal will that people write. It's not about, you know, where will I be buried, what will happen to my uh, estate after me. This is actually a mission statement because Imam begins by saying, uh, you know, the, the first part is negation of uh, wrong motivations to him, and then he explains why. Uh, he says, number one, he says, I have not risen against Yazid because I seek adventure or because I am arrogant or I want to be, uh, you know, unjust uh, and unfair to anyone. No, that these are not the, the reasons. Uh, as far as adventure seeking is concern, you know, we see somebody who goes for seeking an adventure, you know, to accomplish something uh, in a da dangerous situation, he would go by himself, he would take his children with him. Mm -hmm. And so Imam makes it very clear that I'm not seeking uh, adventure here. إِنَّمَا خَرَجْتُ لِطَلَبِ الْإِسْلَافِ أُمَّةِ جَدِّي This is what he writes, he says, I have risen against Yazid because I seek a reformation in the community of my grandfather. I would like to Amr bil Ma'ruf to promote good in the society and prevent people from evil. And he says, by doing this, you know, I'm not doing anything new. Wa asiru bisirat jaddi wa Abi Ali bin Abi Talib. He says, by doing this, I'm just following the same footsteps of my grandfather and my father Ali bin Abi Talib. And, and so that's, it makes very clear that his purpose was based on the religious grounds of Amr bil Ma'ruf and Nahi al-Munkar, which is to promote uh, good in the society and prevent, prevent evil. Uh, it was not as for seeking power, uh, absolutely not. His main purpose was to awakening the slumbering conscience of the Ummah, even at the expense of losing his life and those of who, who were near and dear to you, uh, to him at that time. I think it's um, amazing. Um, Prophet Ibrahim uh, was tested to see whether he can uh, sacrifice his son, and he wasn't even. He didn't go through the whole process because because of the lamb that was sent to him. But um, Imam Hussein uh, was tested by sacrificing so many of his beloved ones. Well, th that's, that's the, the greatness of uh, Imam Hussain that he took this step courageously, consciously, knowingly of the con consequences. He knew that he will lose everything as far as the dunya and the world is concerned. But uh, the greatness is that it was not only he alone he took his, this step, his entire family was with him in this. And that's why we see that when he left Medina, you know, he was not alone. He went his, with his family. Uh, and Mecca was the first uh, point as far as his strategy to let the world know about his stand against uh, Yazid bin Muawiyah. Well, Rizvi, can you discuss uh, why uh, when Imam Hussein left Medina, why did he choose Mecca um, to go there and... After, why did he not complete his Hajj? Why did he leave Mecca? And uh, maybe touch on the significance of the day he left Mecca. Well, as far as uh, the the choice of Mecca uh, is concerned, we had to realize that Imam Hussain alayhi salam, once he made this decision that, I had, that he has to stand up against Yazid, he didn't want that to happen uh, in secrecy. And, and the world doesn't know about it. Those days we didn't have newspapers or radios or reporters or anything like that. The only way where the Imam was able to uh, maximize the exposure of his message was by going to Mecca. Because those days people when they come for Hajj from all different parts of the Muslim world, they actually travel two or three months before. And so, uh, strategically, Mecca was very important. That would be the place where Imam would be able to meet with the people from uh, different parts of uh, the Muslim world. And when they find out why is Hussein there from the month of Sha'ban, which is so far away from Dhul Hijjah, the month of uh, pilgrimage, the questions would come up, and he being the grandson of the Prophet, the only surviving grandson, 
uh, all pilgrims coming from different parts of the world would definitely go and visit him also. So he will get this chance to talk to them and let them know his stand as far as Yazid is concerned. So that, that was the reason why he chose uh, Mecca. But then we see uh, gradually Yazid also gets the information that Hussein is in, in Mecca and uh, Imam Hussein realized uh, that there are people who are coming in the garbs of pilgrims with the intention of killing him even if they find him doing tawaf around the Kaaba. And he didn't want the sanctity of the holy mosque to be violated. But besides that, I think, you know, he could have left Mecca on the first of Zilhijjah, on the third or the fifth. Mm -hmm. But he chose eighth of Zilhijjah, which is very significant. And this was done according to a strategy that Imam had in mind. <coughs> because you can just imagine that eighth of Zilhijjah is the time when all the caravan of uh, pilgrims would be leaving the city of Mecca going to Mina. There's uh, Arafat going there. Um, and on that day, you know, you can see all the Hujjal are going towards Arafat. But there's one caravan going the other way. And so even those Hujjal who are there who have not met Imam Hussain, they will be forced to think, what's, what is this caravan? Why is it going the other way? And this, this was one way to, uh, you know, force them to think about it. Mm. And so the timing itself is, is very significant and when these people go back to their homes, when people come and visit them as, as Hajis, one of the f important things they will hear is that Hussein left his pilgrimage unfinished, un you know, incomplete. And the question will come, why? And then, you know, they will be told because there were assassins who wanted to kill him. But why? And this is the issue comes up. He's not willing to accept Yazid as the ruler. And so this was the, the reason to, you know, maximize the exposure of his message. And, and it's, it's significant that when he leaves uh, Mecca going towards, with the intention of going towards Kufa, uh, his own family members, some of them who stayed behind in, in Medina, when they find, found out, especially Muhammad Hanafiya, that Hussein is planning to travel from Mecca to Kufa. He came to Mecca, met the Imam, and he, you know, tried to prevent him from going to Kufa. He said, why don't you go to some other place? And uh, when they realized the determination of Imam, uh, then they said, but if you're going with this intention, as you say that you know you will be killed, and you're going for the sake of martyrdom, to save Islam, why take your children and your women with you? Why don't you hand them over to us so we go, we can take them back to Medina? And Imam said that, you know, I know what I'm doing. And in essence, later on the events unfolded and we came to realize uh, that if Imam Hussain was alone and killed in, in, in uh, Karbala or just with the men, you know, Imam Hussain will be buried, not only himself, but even his message would be buried in, in Karbala. We believe that the blood of a martyr is, doesn't go in vain. The, the effect will come out, but it will take a long time. But the reason why he took the women and the children was to ensure that the, uh, the, sec the, the consequences of his martyrdom is uh, re realized immediately, and that is by the uh, propaganda or the propagation which will be done by the by the women and the children that Hussein was Muslim and this was the reason why he opposed uh, Yazid and as we look at history later on that is what we see that the credit of conveying the message of Hussein to the masses goes to these women and children who accompanied him from day one today can you uh, go into um, briefly uh, discussing the day of Ashura itself and what took place? Well, as we uh, discussed previously that Imam Hussain decided to take his women and children also along with himself from Mecca, moving in the direction of uh, Kufa. Uh, after reaching to a point before uh, Karbala, the caravan of Imam was intercepted by 
the cavalry force of Yazid. And after many discussions, you know, they agreed to take a path by which they ended up in the desert of Karbala. And that is where the orders came to uh, force Imam Hussein to camp there. And uh, this is the second of Muharram, the year 61st after the Hijra. On the 7th, uh, Imam Hussain al -Salam and his family members and the companions, uh, they were basically even prevented from using the nearby al uh, stream. Uh, finally, they were given the ultimatum to either pledge allegiance to Yazid or be prepared to lose their lives. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam very clearly uh, chose an honorable death over a life of disgrace under a tyrant like Yazid. And uh, eventually on the day of Ashura, which is the 10th of Muharram, uh, 61st after Hijra, which coincided with the 10th of October, uh, year 680 of the Common Era, uh, Imam Hussain alayhi salam and his companions and the family members who n numbered just around 100 people and all of all different age, age groups. Uh, they faced an army of almost uh, 25 to 30,000 soldiers of the Yazidi forces. And on that day, uh, in an unforgettable and uneven battle uh, in Karbala, Imam Hussain and his followers, uh, they basically preferred to die courageously. Um, and uh, they refused basically to, to accept the, the Pledge of Allegiance for Yazid. The outcome of that day was that everyone, with the exception uh, of his one son, every member, male member of the family of Hussein and the companions, uh, they were killed. Not even the six-month-old uh, son of his was uh, spared on that day. And that day is known in, in the history as the day of Ashura, which is the day of great martyrdom. Now, when we look at it, you know, at the first look from the uh, appearance of things, it seems Yaz Yaz Yazid was uh, the winner and Hussein lost everything. Uh, but if you look at the, um, the purpose of the encounter and the objectives that both groups have, you come to see that uh, Yazid won the battle but he lost the, the war because he was not able to achieve his objective of forcing Imam Hussein to pledge allegiance to him. And Imam Hussain was basically able, even his death, to defeat Yazid in this objective. And so when we look at Imam Hussain stand on that life and his martyrdom, this is a very ma magnificent event um, that Muslims always uh, look back to it and they consider this to be a, an, an encounter of truth against fal falsehood and life against uh, death, light and darkness. And that is why we see that the Muslims, Shias and Sunnis alike, you know, keep the memory of that event uh, alive for all the times. What was the short and the immediate impact of um, the event of Karbala? I think the the immediate impact of the events of Karbala is basically tied to the women and children of Imam Hussein. Means when we look at the whole tragedy of Ashura, uh, we can actually say that there are two parts of it. One ended on, on the day of Ashura, led by Imam Hussein, and the other segment of it is the event which goes after Ashura to the end which is led by the women and the children, and Imam Zainul Abidin, of course. And uh, that's a very important part of Imam Hussein's uh, uh, struggle, because the whole purpose was that not, the, not only that he loses his life, but he wanted his martyrdom to be known to the entire Muslim world at that time. And the, the way that he thought was the issue of taking his women and children, uh, after the martyrdom, the Yazidi forces uh, 
they actually displayed uh, the the lowest level of uh, their you know disregard for human dignity and the way they treated the the granddaughters of the prophet and the family women uh, uh, and the children of the Ahlul Bayt is really not acceptable by any standards, uh, by any Muslim or non-Muslim. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala works in mysterious ways. Yazid wanted to humiliate Hussein, uh, but by bringing his family as captives all the way to his own court, um, he, ex- ex- uh, he, you know, basically exposed himself. And especially if you look at the, the khutbah gi- given by Bibi Zainab, which is really powerful, very moving. Uh, you know, maybe I must uh, describe just one segment of it where she addresses Yazid by saying, Yabn al which means son of the freed slave. See, the people of Syria always look at Yazid and his father Muawiyah as the people who are like the royal family. Uh, and what they were told about their connection with Rasulullah was as if they are very close to one another. And now you have the granddaughter of the Prophet in the court of Yazid, in the presence of the dignitaries of Syria. She is addressing him by saying, you are the son of the freed slave. Referring to the event of the conquest of Mecca, when the Prophet had the religious right to make his Yazid's father and grandfather and others his own slaves. But he said, I, you know, release you. And, and so that, that basically must have been a great shock to Yazid to see that somebody can stand up in his court, a, you know, his own prisoner, uh, and expose the reality of Yazid and his family. Uh, and, and so th- this was basically the beginning of the end of Banu Umayyah and the, uh, the establish of the Umayyads, especially this family of Ab- uh, Ali Abu Sufyan, that was the end of it. Uh, they were not able to survive. Uh, and, and so the impact was, in a way, uh, immediate all around the Muslim world. Um, not only Syria, even in, in Medina, you know, there was a very important event which took place just two years after the uh, tragedy of Karbala. No, uh Going back to um, Yazid, and uh, first he brought me of uh, the Prophet to show that he was victorious in the war. And at the end, he ended up having the first um, commemoration for Imam Hussein in his um, well, castle. And that's, that's true that, uh, you know, the, the impact of the, the words of uh, Zainab and Imam Zain al-Abideen basically forced Yazid to... Uh, at least, you know, in appearance, uh, say that, you know, I regret what happened and I didn't want this to happen. He started to put the blame on his governor, mm-hmm. Ibn Ziyad. Yes. And that itself shows that, you know, if you really want to see who is the vic- uh, victorious group in this group, it is, it is Hussein and his family. And eventually, yes, he was forced to let them go. And... Uh, but the first thing they did was that we want the opportunity to, to mourn and grieve on our family without any hindrance uh, and obstacles. And so that was also, in a way, arranged by Yazid uh, himself. Um, well, yeah. Now, I'd like to ask you about the long-term uh, impact of um, Ashura and uh, what it did for us and what it's doing for us uh, today, basically. I think the the impact of Imam Hussein's uh, martyrdom and sacrifice um, it it impacted on different level uh, to different groups among the Muslims themselves. Of course, you know the the supremacy of Quran and the Sunnah was again maintained. Uh, no more could a, a ruler come and say, you know, whatever I say is the final word. You know, if he goes openly against the Qur'an and the Sunnah, you know, people had that uh, courage to stand up, uh, looking at the example of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Mm-hmm. So the, the impact of Imam Hussain is not just limited to the Shias, but even to the uh, Muslim world at large. 
And that is why we see that, you know, when we talk about Hussein or the memorial services for Imam Hussein, this is commonly, uh, you know, organized by Shias as well as the Sunnis. Uh, you go to many uh, mus Muslim countries where there are no Shias, but if you talk about Imam Hussein and Yazid, you will see they are with Hussein and against uh, Yazid. So the impact of Imam has been universal as far as the Muslim world is uh, concerned. Although, sorry to interrupt you, but um, surprisingly, Muawiyah, some of them still accept Muawiyah as someone that was good, but because of the event of Karbala, uh, the true face of Yazid was shown, but to some of them, uh, because Muawiyah was so deceiving, they still well, that's that that's, uh, that's true that Muawiyah is still looked upon as a as a you know great ruler as far as the Sunni history is concerned. But at least when it comes to the issue of Yazid, we see almost universal condemnation of him. Mm -hmm. uh, as far as the Shias are concerned, you know I can say by studying the Shia history that wherever you see the growth of the Shia community in all different parts of the world, you will see that the first point where the community gets together is in the name of Imam Hussein during the um, month of Muharram. Mm -hmm. So that, that magnetic power of Imam Hussein's you know, martyrdom is still there and it can be felt even now. Um, as far as the rest of the humanity is concerned, I think the, the example that Imam Hussain provided, that it's not the military might which is powerful, rather it's the moral authority which is more important. Uh, we see that even non-Muslim leaders have acknowledged this uh, aspect of Imam Hussain, and they actually looked at it as a, as a uh, you know, source of inspiration for their own movements. We look at the example of Gandhi. You know, he is known to be the father of this, uh, uh, you know, non-violent uh, movement or protest against the oppressor. And if you look at his words and his, uh, you know, uh, statements, you will see he is referring to Imam Hussain alayhi salam as one of the examples that he had in his mind when he adopted this non-violent uh, strategy. And then you can connect that with even, uh, you know, uh, Dr. King of the United States of America, who started this movement uh, of civil uh, rights uh, for the Afro-Americans. He basically is looking back at Gandhi as an example. And Gandhi is looking at Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Then you have Nelson Mandela looking at these two individuals as example. And you can trace everything back to you know, Imam Hussain alayhi salam. Well, thank you so much for uh, sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, you've uh, enlightened us on the topic of Imam Hussain alayhi salam. And thank you for being on our program. Well, I would like to thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. And uh, I hope the viewers also uh, were able to gain something as far as Imam Hussain alayhi salam is concerned. And I would like to end with the dua that may Allah keep us always among the true followers of Imam, Imam Hussain and the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wa salam. InshaAllah. Um, thank you for uh, staying with us. Uh, we hope that you'll join us in our uh, next programs when we talk about uh, the Ahlul Bayt alayhi salam. May God be with you and goodbye. Islam in Focus is brought to you by Gala Travels. For all your travel needs, call Gala Travels at 416-491-5314 or visit galatravels.com. Islam in Focus is brought to you by PortServe International Limited, providing cargo handling services internationally. Please visit portserve.com. Islam in Focus is brought to you by Five Ways Financial. Free consultation at no obligation. Visit fiveways.com.